Good morning. Um, welcome to my talk about aggregating data in Django using database views. So a bit about me, so uh, my pronouns are he, him. I go by Mickey, if, if you come and talk to me and you struggle to pronounce the name. Um, I was born not really far from here, actually, uh, in a very nice uh, hospital, but I currently live in, uh, live in London. Um, I've been coding in Python for more years than not at this point, uh, and for 10 years I've been uh, using Django. Um, I particularly care about uh, Django's interactions with the database, so this is one of the topics that I care about. And I also really like testing, so if anybody's been to PyCon CZ, you might have seen my talk about testing. I'm a staff engineer at Zelix, or Zelix. Um, we're a startup scale-up in London. Um, we're hiring on all fronts, so if you, if you need a job in London, come and talk to me. We use all of the technologies in this talk. We use it quite a lot, and we do a lot of other things, um, including a lot of data science. Um, the slides, I posted them on the Discord. They're on Pre-Talk X. They're on my website. There's going to be a QR code at the end. There's also a working POC in that repository with the source. Um, so. Um, what are we going to be talking about? So I'm going to give a brief overview of aggregating data in Django using the native Django ORM. And then I'm going to introduce you to database views. Um, we're going to integrate database views in Django using this package called the Django PG Views Redux. And then we're going to talk about materialized views, which is a special class of materialized views that can help your performance. There are some prerequisites. You're probably not going to enjoy this talk very much if you don't know some Django and some SQL, but I will try to go through everything in quite a lot of detail. Uh, Miro is laughing because he probably doesn't use either of them very much. <laughs> um, so what do I mean by aggregating data in J Django, right? So aggregation for me is combining multiple pieces of information into a single result. And any sort of statistics or reporting usually involves aggregation. You have a lot of data, you need to present it to the user in a readable form, you need to somehow combine all of the information into some readable output. And if you've used Django RM, one of the things that you've definitely used is this method called count. This query set method called count counts the number of objects in that query set. And that's a very basic aggregation, right? So before we start into going exam like see examples of this uh, count method and other aggregation methods, let's define a model that we're gonna be using throughout. So this is a model we can used to store individual visits a user makes to a website and individual sections. So, you know, we import uh, models.model, um, we inherit models.model, and we've got a user, we've got a section, this is character field, it can be whatever, right? Like it could be integer field, you could have choices, and then we've got the ex exact visits time, right? So, if we come back to the count method, right, uh, you can just run it like this, page visit.objects.count, and that will return the number of objects in that table. and as I said, it, it works on the, on the query sets itself. So if you filter the query set for a specific section, let's say section index, it will return a different count, right? So this is actually just syntactic sugar around a method called aggregate. Um, this is a method um, on query sets that will return the aggregation on the entire query set. Um, the aggregate method always returns a dictionary, and uh, you can, we can see how the count method is actually implemented under the hood. So we call this method aggregate, um, and we define some name of the, the aggregation, and we use this method called count from Django DB models. That's the aggregation uh, function that we're using. And then finally, we've got the same exact result that we has as we had before. Right? So there's many different aggregation functions in Django that it has it inbuilt. So one of them is the max. So it will return a maximum value of a specific column. In this example, we've got the maximum visit time to visit to section index, right? And it's it returns a dictionary where there's an auto-generated key that will return the maximum visit in the database. You've got minimum, right? These two uh, work on any uh, like comparable columns. There's other methods like sum, average, standard deviation. Those wouldn't really make sense on times, but you could do it on some integers, for example. And you can define your own, right? A second way of aggregating data in Django is using the annotate method. So the annotate method aggregates per item in the query set. Imagine if we want to count the number of visits a, all of the users have made. We can use this annotate method to define a new property called total visits, which is the count of page visits that exists for that specific user. And if we evaluate the query set, Django will automatically generate this magic uh, total visits, which will be the count that the user has made. And finally, the annotate method in combination with the values method aggregates per unique value. If we want to, for example, say what's the maximum visit time per section, um, 
we can ret use this dot values. We put the section, we want a unique value per section. And then we have to annotate the maximum visit time. And it will return a query set, which will contain a list of uh, dictionaries. We've got the unique uh, sections, and we've got the individual visit times. Right? You can put multiple values in the value section, uh, like multiple columns, so it will be per section per user, for example. Or you can have multiple annotates in the annotate method. So you can have the maximum and minimum time, let's say, right? And this is actually the, the kind of aggregation that I'm gonna be looking at for the rest of the talk. So let's actually build something with, with this, right? So let's build an API that shows count of section visits per user per day. We can use this in Django using Django REST framework, for example, to make it easy. And we just have to you know, implement list API view and define a get query set methods. Um, we want to get the visits per day, so we actually have to first extract the date from the date time. Um, sorry, and then uh, we want it per user, per section, per visit date, so we've got multiple values in the uh, values. And then annotate is just the number, like the count, the objects per unique values. And for the good measure, we can just order it. Uh, we obviously need to define a serializer. So in the serializer, we have to actually explicitly say what all of the columns are. So we've obviously got the user section visit data again, integer character field, date field, and then we've got the count, which is an integer field, right? And if we run it, we'll get a response like this in the JSON, right? If I take us under the hood, this is the SQL query that it's gonna run in the database. Um, so first, we've got what we're selecting, the individual columns in the, in the select. So we've got the three, unique values, like per user, per section, per visit date. We can see that Django translates it to user ID instead of just user. And we've got the count. The count is fortunately very similarly named in Django and um, SQL, so it makes it pretty easy to read. Um, and then we've got, we're selling the, selecting it from this specific table, and we've got the group by. The group by is what makes it unique uh, in the result, so we've got it per user, per section. Django does a clever little thing here that it refers to a previous column. Like, so it refers to column three, which is the visit date, and then we've got the order, right? So there, are, it works, right? Obviously it works, uh, but there's some downsides, right? So uh, it's very powerful, but then there's the downside. So what I find pretty annoying, it, it returns dictionaries, not objects. So if you wanna define any custom methods on the aggregation, let's say, you have to you know, define a function, call it on the dictionary, or go through some uh, another uh, like layer of modifying the data. The foreign keys are uh, like selected only as the primary keys by default. Um, and if you wanna display more information about the user, for example, you either have to put it in the values uh, so you want to explicitly list everything that you want to select, or you have to select it extra with like the custom method or something like that. Displaying needs to be fairly manual, so because the aggregation returns a dictionary, Django doesn't necessarily know what the dictionary will be. So in the serializer, we had to list everything explicitly and the types as well. Um, reusing the aggregation can be a little tricky. Like if you want to use this sort of aggregation multiple times, you might have to like define a method on the query. So define a method on a manager or have a, some like service layer that will always return this aggregation. And it can be quite slow, right? So these are some of the issues. So this is where database views comes in. A database view is a virtual table in a database defined by a query. And it behaves like a normal table would be if you're selecting. It actually, from looking at the SQL query, you will not necessarily even know it's a database view without knowing it's a database view because it just behaves like a normal table. So it evaluates every single time, so it doesn't necessarily help us on the speed because like Django aggregation would evaluate every single time, a database views evaluates under the hood every single time, and it's essentially just syntactic sugar, right? And it's supported by most uh, databases, and it doesn't use any extra disk space because it's just a simple definition. It evaluates every, every single time. So you create a database view by running an SQL query, and the most important part here is the, the declaration create view and the name of a view and as, and then follows the rest of the query. And this is pretty much the same exact query as we had before. You know, we've got the select uh, individual columns, we've got the group by as before, we've got the count, and we've got where we're selecting from. Okay, but, so this is very nice, right? But like, how do I use this in Django? And this is where we finally get to like what I wanna uh, show you the most. Uh, this library called Django PG Views Redux. So this is a library which adds good support for database use in Django. In my view, it's pretty good support. So I've been maintaining it for the last couple of years uh, as part of my job at Zelix. Um, and it's a fairly normal store. I forked a library called Django PG Views by a company called Pebble. They weren't maintaining it. I needed new Django support. 
uh, they didn't provide it. And while I was there, I added a bunch more features and other contributors have added some features as well. So a couple of the features that I've added was supporting indexes. Uh, there's a smarter way of syncing the, material, the views. There is like dynamic SQL support, so you don't have to define it by a single query because you can generate the SQL dynamically. And contributors have added m support for multiple databases and better schema support. So you can have multiple different schemas with uh, database views. So it supports all modern Python and Django. I update it every time there's a new Python and new Django, and there's new features. And unfortunately, it's Postgres specific. So like I said, the database views are supported by most relational databases, but this library is Postgres specific primarily because the original library was Postgres specific. You could probably make it so that it works on MySQL, but I haven't. I might do at some point, but probably not the, like in the, in the nearest future. So, how to use it. So first, obviously, you need to install it. I prefer Poetry. And then you in include it in your installed apps. And then defining a view is very similar to how you define an, uh, the view and a model in SQL. So you just need to import a view from Django PG views and call it visit summary view, for example, and you define it by SQL, right? So instead of, <laughs> Mira's laughing, <laughs> but this is how you define a, a, a view, right? So you, you define the SQL that we want to run. Uh, it's pretty similar to what we had before on the side when I was doing it manually in SQL. There's one special uh, case here, uh, this row number over brackets as ID. So Django models require a uh, primary key everywhere, and it's ID by default. So in, in our views, that's just a constraint of the library, we always need an ID column. Uh, so Django just works, right? So this, the easiest way is just to increment the rows as they're selected. Uh, and this is what row number over brackets as ID does, right? And then as we would do with normal model, we define the individual columns that are returned from the view itself. So we've got a user. This time, we don't want to cascade because if we did cascade, Django would try to delete from a view, but view is read only, so it would fail. So we want to do, do nothing. And then we've got a section, a character field as before. Visit date, it's, this time it's actually a date instead of a date field because we're extracting the date. And then we've got the count as integer field. And if you want to then use it, um, we first have to like create it in the database. So there's a management command for this. It's very similar to how migrate works, or actually it's SyncDB. Every time you run it, it goes through all of the views that you've defined in your code base, and it checks the database if it's there or not, and creates it. If it's not there, updates it if it's changed. So after we create it, um, we can see that this is how the aggregate view looked before, right? So we had to define this somewhat complicated query set. If we use the, the new database view, the query set becomes very simple. We just select it uh, from visit summary view and we order it by count. So even here, like we can see that it's already pretty simpler. Um, and then we obviously need to define a uh, view serializer. So uh, in the view serializer, we can just say, you know, this, this is the model that you're supposed to look at and these are the fields I want to serialize. So it's going to automatically pick up the available fields and it's automatically going to pick up what the types are and it's going to serialize. And we can go further, we can actually add the user as a nested field there because it behaves like a normal database model for selecting data. So we can add a nested user serializer and it will just select everything as we need to. Right? And we didn't have to do anything much extra to get this information. Once again, I'll take you under the hood. So this is the query that will, it will run. So the important here, thing here is it selects from this visit summary view. This is what I called the, the view when I created it. And from looking at this, you wouldn't actually know it's a database view. It behaves like a normal table and so on. So we've got the columns that we defined. We've got the ID there as we defined it. We've got related uh, user field and it, it just works, right? So how does this fix the downsides that I've, I've listed? So this time, it's not returned as dictionaries. It's returns as objects. It's the instances of the, of the view class. So we can define any custom methods on that uh, view model, and it, they're just going to work. We can also define a custom query set. We can also define a custom manager for, for the view itself. Foreign keys no longer are just primary key. We can lazy load related objects, as we would do with normal Django models. Uh, we can use select related, prefetch related, all of this stuff. The displaying is no longer manual because Django and other libraries will automatically discover what the fields are in the model itself and detect their types so that they can just use them. And reusing is no longer cumbersome because you just have this model that you can use everywhere you want it. The one thing that it doesn't fix, it's it doesn't make it faster because under the hood, views evaluate every single time 
right? So it's not gonna make it faster. The slight caveat is if you need to select extra fields, like the user details, you don't have to put it in the group by, which is what makes it unique. So that might be a little bit faster, but I presume Postgres is pretty smart and doesn't actually need to, but it doesn't in general make it faster. So there's some other features, so you can define an admin view for it, like if, if, because it just behaves like a normal model. You might wanna make sure that it, a user doesn't try to create in the view because it's just gonna die a horrible death. It doesn't support any uh, writes because it's a read-only view. And there's like other, other anything else that uses uh, the fields from the models you can use. So there is, for example, a, a library called Django Filters, which makes it really easy to filter your views in REST framework, for example, which automatically discovers types of filters based on the field. It's a field type, right? So we can just define, this is the model, these are the sections, uh, like these are the fields I wanna filter on. <coughs> Once again, we're gonna look under the hood. So this is actually how it looks under the hood. So it actually just wraps the query uh, and selects from it. So under the hood, it's actually still evaluating every single time. Like this is very important, right? It's not gonna make it any faster, even though it looks pretty. And if, if the underlying query is slow, your like, usage of it is still, it will be st uh, still slow. Right? And therefore, the materialized views comes in. Uh, materialized view is a specific type of database views that when you create it, it actually evaluates the entire query and writes the results to disk. And when you're then querying that materialized view, instead of it evaluating every single time, it will read from the, the, the stored disk uh, values, right? There's a caveat to that. Obviously, if your underlying data changes, uh, the, the materialized view becomes stale, and you need to then refresh it. So that's, it can be a trade-off, right? And we're gonna talk about the trade-offs in a bit. So you need to refresh the data to recalculate the results, right? Uh, as, because it's on disk, you can then also add indexes, right? Because it's on disk, you can use indexes to speed up lookup from the materialized view to itself. And obviously the indexes then also need to look up every time you refresh or create a view. And, oh, sorry, it does use extra database space because it writes the entire results to disk. And this can be quite a lot of, depending on your aggregation, this can be quite a lot of data that uh, like gets written to your disk extra. So when it's good to use materialized views. So the first uh, is when you don't care that the data can be still. So this is one of the use cases that we use it for uh, a lot at Zelix is we've got a lot of these reporting materialized views where we are looking at usage of our, on our site for the last you know, five years, let's say. And because uh, we don't necessarily care about today, we just refresh it once a day or like actually when a user wants to look at it. Um, at, but at maximum once a day, and it will refresh the aggregation and you can look at all of the usage over the last you know, five years without it querying the underlying data over and over and over again. So if you don't care that your data can be a little bit stale, this is a great uh, use case for materialized views because it will just refresh um, when you need it to and it will have most of the data eventually uh, there, right? Another one is when you have batch processes updating your data. So this is the second use case we use it for a lot. Uh, at Zelix, we import customer data once a day from our syst uh, like customer systems. So after we run the batch process, we refresh some materialized views with statistics, and it's valid until we do another batch process for uh, up like importing the data. That means, you know, it's it's valid for most of the time, and it speeds up a lot of the, the like analysis and. Different, uh, different statistics that we provide to our customers because you know, it updates once a day, you can just refresh it once a day. So when it's not, to, like, it's not good to use them. So if you need to refresh up, then it's kind of the opposite, right? If you if you're need your view to be up to date all of the time or you need to refresh very often, it's gonna be really bad because depending on what the aggregation does, uh, it, it can take quite a long time to actually create or refresh the materialized view. Um, and it needs to, like, uh, to drive home the point, like, it needs to read all of the source data, it needs to run all of the c calculations on it, and it needs to write. So it's gonna hit the disk really hard on read and on write, and it's gonna hit the CPU pretty hard. Um, so if, you're, if, you're, if you need to uh, refresh often, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna uh, take up a lot of your resources in your database. If the data volume is big, it's, uh, it's kind of what I said, like it will need to read all of the data, I need to write all of the data. So it will become a bottleneck, reading and writing it. And you might think, you know, oh, this will be forever perfect, right? But uh, from experience, when you grow from 100,000 
to a million rows to 100 million rows, <laughs> suddenly that becomes really problematic. Like a view that works uh, on a small customer will not necessarily work on a large customer. And like if the query is slow in general, like it will be quite problematic for you. Um, so uh, defining a materialized view is pretty simple. Like in com you just need add this little keyword materialized here uh, and it will just work. And uh, when you run this query, it will populate the table, uh, the, like the, the stored table with all of the results. And you can then just query it as you would do a normal view. So if we're using the Django PG views library, instead of importing view, we just import materialized view. And that's kind of the only like, thing that we need to change out of the box. To use it, uh, we still need to run the things PG views um, command that will re uh, create the materialized views. And then to refresh the materialized views, if your data becomes stale and you want to refresh the, uh, refresh the data in the materialized view, you call this refresh PG views command uh, as a change. And then you can also refresh the view from Django itself, from Python code, uh, if you want to trigger it in Celery or whatever. Uh, and if you want to use the materialized views, it becomes exactly like before. It, it's going to work exactly the same as before. So there's some other views, uh, use cases. So I've been mostly talking about the aggregation, really, uh, because that's the easiest example. But it doesn't necessarily have to be aggregating data. It can be, for example, one-to-one -one with some other table. Um, you know, with Django one-to-one -one -one field. Um, you can have some cal extra calculated fields in your materialized view or in your normal view, or you can have it as a denormalized table. Um, this can be useful for selecting data, indexing, and all sorts of stuff. And it could also be expansive rather than reductive, right? You can have a union uh, as you materialize views if you need it. It can be larger than the original source if you need it to be, once again, for denormalizing the database. Anything that runs as a select query can ultimately become a materialized view or a normal view, right? Um, another cool use case is backwards compatibility. Let's say you've changed your database schemas uh, in such a way that some or a lot of your old code base is set up to work with a specific table that you've changed dramatically. You can define a view that behaves exactly like the original table but f pulling from diff different tables uh, that like change. And then you can gradually replace the individual use, like places that use it uh, without changing everything at once. Right? And uh, it, you can use it to store expensive calculated fields. Um, this is particularly useful if you're doing the batch processes, I would say, because um, uh, after you uh, run it, like import batch data, you can just calculate expensive calculated fields. I would not recommend using this long term because usually, as I've like learned, is usually only like 5% of the data changes every day, right? So, but the materialized views always refreshes from scratch every single time. There's some uh, fancy Postgres libraries for updating just what needs to be updated. I haven't played around with them and the library doesn't support them. But if you're using the normal Postgres materialized views, it will recalculate everything from scratch. So if your data grows, I would definitely not recommend using it long term. Uh, but as a quick hack, if you're in a startup and you just need it to get, get it to working and you, you can care about optimizing it later, uh, this is something you can do uh, quite well. So just to summarize what we've learned, um, so you can use database views to make it easier to develop your apps. They have pros and cons as everything in life. And if you want to use um, database views in Postgres, in Django, you can check out this library, Django PG Views Redux. If you need an extra feature, there is a bunch of features that I haven't mentioned. Uh, and you can talk to me after if you have more ideas. And in general, if you just want to chat about database views. And that's it. Thank you very much. And this is the slides. Thank you very much, Miki. Um, so we have five minutes for a few questions. Um, if anyone has a question, yeah. Hello. Uh, so just a disclaimer, uh, last time I used Django or SQL uh, directly uh, was uh, 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and I was actually uh, writing models in Django that used SQL views instead of tables. Yeah. And you said that a, that a view is like a table. Yes. And, it, and it is. It worked. Yeah. I, all I had to do was never try to write anything. <laughs> yes. 
So my question basically is why, why do we need a library to do this if we can just pretend it's a table? So I think what the library specifically does, it makes it very easy to manage the views themselves. So you can use uh, database views without the library. It's just gonna be a little bit more cumbersome to actually uh, define them. So you will have to run your own SQL query to create a database view. And then you will have to define the model and just say it's not managed and point it to the name, right? That will work. Um, but that, that works for normal views, I would say, definitely quite well. But you will have to manage the, the SQL queries yourselves, which might become really annoying if you have like 15 and you need to change them. So there's a the sync PG views command just does it for you and it like handles the updates uh, correctly. So it, uh, uh, you don't have to manage it yourself, essentially. Uh, the, what I think the real benefit of the library is actually the materialized views, where um, you need some extra stuff to refresh your materialized views. So like you can also do the same approach, just define it manually in SQL and just point it, point your table to it with managed false. But if you then need to like refresh them and refresh them in a specific order, let's say, and some other features, you might have to um, do quite a lot of custom coding where like this library just kind of does it for you. Yeah. Thanks. Over there. Yeah. Hi, um, I have a very naive question. Sure. So, when you presented your your view and materialized view um, parent classes, basically the, the view selection is raw text uh, in the SQL attribute. Yes. I was wondering if if it's possible, if it would be possible um, to basically have like. Imagine a migration system or plug in the migration system from Django to have a um, compilation of the of using when you use the ORM to define your aggregation, yeah. right? So the, the earlier yeah. example. So you, you, uh, just to uh, if I understand, like you basically want to use a query set to define a view, right? Or like yeah, exactly. Like yeah. Yeah, you just write ORM code and then you have yeah. a migration step that pre-compiles that to the yeah. equivalent SQL statement. So. so that there is like uh, a couple of people submitted tickets about it, and we've actually experimented with it at the at my, at my company. It works in certain scenarios. Um, it's not always very easy to get to the raw SQL from a database, like from a query set. Um, it is sort of possible, and this is some, something I would really like to add, where you just define instead of defining SQL and a string, right? You just say query set equals, and you have a query set that's querying some other data. Uh, there's ways around it. So one of the features that I've added to uh, the library is actually you can, instead of an SQL property, you have a, a static method called get SQL where you can run whatever. And like as long as it returns a valid SQL, it, it works. Right? But I would like to build in more like explicit support for this sort of behavior where you just define a query set and it will work based on that. Uh, it's one of, the, one of the things I will uh, look at uh, soonish uh, with the library. Great, thanks. The last question, and then we can. Hi. Um, uh, I have a question about the materialized views. Yeah, sure. Um, how do refreshing the data is actually done under the hood? Is there some SQL uh, query that oh, yes. triggers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so when I showed the, the management command refresh PG views or the, the method Re, dot refresh on the materialized views. Under the hood, it actually calls another SQL query to the database, which is refresh view and name of view, and that's pretty much it. So it's a, it's a SQL command that you can you can run uh, if you want to do it manually, or uh, the the library calls it for you if uh, if you want to do that. Thank you. Oh, uh, there's one really final nice. question over there. A really nice, simple one to finish off. Um, in your Django management command, I think I saw that you had like a command with a subcommand. Um, how did you get that to work? I'm, 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 uh, I don't follow. What do you mean? Uh, what do you mean subcommand? Uh, like here? It, oh, is that a hyphen sync dash PG views? Uh, yeah, so this is just okay. a normal management command. So the Python manage pi, and this is the name of the command. And these are two different uh, management commands. These are just logs that it printed. Yep. Perfect. Thank you very much. OK. okay. Thank you very much. And uh, enjoy you. your talks, uh, the rest of your EuroPython conference. And maybe see you at the socials. Sure. Right. Thank you. Thank you.